Hello everyone, uh, my name is Rich Rogers. I'm the moderator for this panel. Uh, welcome to Indie Plus's Game Night. And this is on um, the March Game Night. We're going to be talking about GMless games tonight. And uh, the little blurb that we have for this is game designers, um, we're talking about tabletop role-playing games. Game designers talk about pushing the envelope with role-playing games and doing things that would have Gary Gygax spinning in his grave. We're going to be chatting about the trials of inventing something new, whether GMless games are just a novelty, and whether story games are really role-playing games at all. Hmm, that's a loaded term. Uh, I have a bunch of experts uh, in this who've all made games or talk about games or play games, um, whatever range of that you'd like to think about. So I'm going to start off with introducing uh, Jason Morningstar, who's a game designer and co-founder of Bully Pulpit Games, and he probably is best known for his game Fiasco. Welcome, Jason. Oh, Jason, I believe you're muted. Can you unmute? Thanks. I'm glad to be here. Great. <laughs> and then all the way across the pond, and I say that because I'm Americanocentric, is uh, Joe J. Prince. He's the British games designer behind Prince of Darkness Games, passionate advocate of tarot-based and GMless RPGs, best known for the gritty, pugilistic game Contenders. Hello, Joe. Hi there. Great to be here. Great. And then we have Mark Diaz Truman. He's the designer of Our Last Best Hope, which is a GMless game about saving humanity from a terrible crisis. He's working on a new GMless game, which is being played tonight. Uh, which is March 16th as part of Indie Plus's game night, and that game is called Eternity, and that's where players take on the role of powerful gods. Currently living in Boston with his partner, Marissa Kelly. Hello, Mark. Hey. Uh, now, next we have McGay Baker, who's the owner of Night Sky Games, and she's been involved with independent publishing for 15 years. Uh, she publishes her own games, written for Robin Law's Hillfolk Drama System and the Any Award-winning Gaming as Women blog. She and her husband, fellow game designer D. Vincent Baker, raised three sons in Western Mass. Also, she spent a decade playing mostly GMless or co-GM games with Vincent and Emily Kerboss. Hello, Meg. Hello. And last but not least, we have Nathan Paoletta. Uh, I'm sorry, Nathan is, is Paoletta, right? Or did I totally yeah. It, that, that is correct. There are other <laughs> correct ways to say it. But that's... There are other correct ways. I'll take that as the most correct for now. Uh, he's an independent designer and publisher. His GMless games include the gothic horror game Annalise and the micro games Witness the Murder of Your Father and Be Ashamed Young Prince and Vesna Thaw. Hello, Nathan. Hello. Great. So GMless games are where... And you guys correct me, you're the experts, but it's basically a tabletop role-playing game experience where we have broken apart the authority, or normally in a tabletop role-playing game we have one person who is the game master, who mm -hmm. is uh, the arbiter of the rules, right? Um, but in GMless games, you guys are really breaking apart that. Um, is, Mark, is that basically how I could understand what a GMless game is, or is there something I'm missing? Well, I think authority structures play a large a large role in, in determining um, how games play out, and so GMless games do break that up. But I think it's also um, about how much uh, structure the game has, or where the structure goes. So I think in my time of designing GMless games, I think less about um, you know where if there is an authority or not, but how that authority is distributed among the different uh, the different players. Okay. Um, Nathan, I'm going to start with you because you listed a whole lot of GMless games, so you're probably an expert. <laughs> um, when I when I requested some questions earlier from some of the Indie Plus followers, one of the questions I got was from Epidiah Ravishall, uh, and his question is pretty cool. I like it. Which of the traditional GM functions is hardest to distribute? Hmm. That's a hard question to lead off with. It is. Um, I could start I, an easier one. So <laughs> no, no, it's like no, no. It's a good question. Uh, I think I just need to spin up to it a little bit. Uh, so I think there's one one thing I will, I kind of wanted to bring up generally was that GM list is kind of the term that we use a lot. But for a while, it was also kind of in vogue to talk about GM full games, mm -hmm. um, right? Where the idea is it's not that you're taking the GM out of the game; it's that you are kind of making everyone playing have some of that kind of authority or have some of those things that 
that the GM traditionally does. Um, so I think uh, it's relatively easy to, I guess, distribute stuff like scene framing, right? Where it's mm -hmm. like, who gets to say where the next scene is or who's in it or what's going on? Like, that's pretty straightforward to kind of be like, um, you know, okay, you could break that apart in so many different ways. Everyone can take a turn or whatever. Um, but then stuff that's more like uh, if someone has a strong conceptual, like, idea for how the game should be, like, what's the tone or what's an overarching kind of narrative or something, that's a lot harder to do with multiple people, I think. Um, so there's some relationship of, like, how the game is structured to how the players interact with each other, where that needs to either emerge or be constructed. And with a, a traditional GM game, the GM does it a lot of the time, right? I want to tell the story of, of valor and sacrifice or whatever, and then they kind of construct the storyline or the world or the opposition to create that. Um, I think it's a little harder to just assign, and it's a little more of a... a back and forth kind of we really have to figure out how to make that emerge I think that's pretty difficult yeah. I would Jason, agree I think I'll that the, the, the um, I'm sorry Richard you... no go right ahead okay. I, was I think that the uh, um, what Nathan's bring up is the uh, umbrella you know big picture long term view all those things that uh, it's easier to have one vision mm -hmm. in that space uh, and if you're going to break up the, the overarching uh, course of an epic game, that's tricky. <laughs> that is tricky. <laughs> right, and have it feel feel right, right? And right. Have it have kind of a cohesion and have yeah. consequences that, you know, come from earlier choices and stuff like that. Right. Yeah. Something that I would add to that, this is this is awkward with, with five of us because I'm not sure when to jump in. I don't want to cut anybody mm -hmm. off, so I apologize in advance if I do. Um, uh, is the, the, the GM is often uh, also someone who enforces uh, social level things like mm -hmm. tone and pacing, and um, yeah. those things have to be arrived at in another way if there's not a central figure to decide those. And I think yeah. that's, that I might vote for that being the most challenging thing to, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to produce. To yeah, I, I could agree with that, to be honest. I mean, there's, there's the one vision thing as well. It is a hard, very hard thing to convey when you're splitting that out as well. And especially if it's some sort of um, mystery game, investigatory game, where part of the game is exploring the world and finding out the hidden parts of the world. Mm -hmm. That's very hard to do, generously, I think. So that kind of revelation of mysteries role as a GM is, is a pretty hard thing to do, but but I would still say that's secondary to, you know, um, maintaining the social roles in the group and saying what's acceptable, what's not, and setting the tone, which generally you look to a GM to do that. Uh. Mark, did you have anything to add about uh, particular functions that are difficult to distribute? I think these guys got it. Meg said, Meg looked like she wanted to say something. Um. I was just following on what Joe said, um, that if you're having uh, a tone, you know, if you're setting a tone, a specific tone, uh, you definitely need a, a clear voice, a uh, clear vision for that. But um, having a, a breaking apart uh, the um, sort of world building aspect of a situation, that can happen in a GM-less game as long as there's good um, communication between the players and also the size of your group becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's just three players, I think that we can do investigative games if we're investigating our surroundings or, or you know, trying to figure out details about a thing, but straight up mysteries where somebody we know, like, how did he die? And somebody knows and we're trying to find out. That's very difficult to do, do GMless. Yeah. It works great to do if we all agree that we don't know a thing and we're going to play to find out. Uh, yeah. you know, if we're, if it's like, here we are, the three of us, and this is from gm -less stuff or co-GM stuff with Vincent and Emily. Uh, we found this thing. We don't know what it does. And then we're going to explore and come up with ideas and over the course of play, it comes up that this little bone 
implement that we found is for you is is the purpose of it is to move dead bodies. What you know? So mm -hmm. there's a thing where straight up mysteries no, but investigative stuff where we're investigating the world can work in a GMO situation if you've got people who are in accord enough on the social level. And that's what we've all, like Joe and Nathan especially, have hit that. Mm -hmm. and, and so is, so is Jason. That the, doing a jamless game, I think, takes a different level of buy-in from all the players mm -hmm. than doing a GM'd game. Um, because you're, you're going to be stepping up in different ways. Mm -hmm. So, just to dovetail off of your statement there, Meg, uh, a question that I have is: It do you think it's the responsibility of the text to create a framework for for that uh, uh, shared space and, and how you're going to work together, or is that really something on a social level that while you don't have someone called the GM, you really need a facilitator to make this kind of work? So, so from designing, so the two GMless games I've designed are very, very, very different, right? The, our last best hope, you know, draws heavily on like the fiasco tradition, or at least that's where I found it of giving the game a structure that carries it from scene to scene by letting the players really um, be sort of me centric, like bring their own spotlight scene and say, "I think this is interesting," and then the next person says, "Well, I think this is interesting," and that. Is they're not they're not really related, but they get related because people tend to like to tie a string. You know, if there's an open loose string, people want to close it, mm -hmm. and it's a really nice natural tendency. Um, but yeah. Eternity, the other game I have is is actually about creating scenes that are um, a little more competitive, where someone will say, "Well, I want this to be the scene," and someone says, "That's great. Let me complicate that and throw something in there that's really different and push you to do something different with the scene." And and that requires a lot more structure to be able to do mm -hmm. safely and not to just have each scene blow up as you go through. And so a lot of my playtesting has been about trying to tweak that structure to be really effective. Whereas with Our Last Best Hope, you know, Jason had done this amazing work with spotlight scenes and like really gotten a good sense of what they could do. And it was like, oh yeah, you just tell people, do your thing and, and it works. And so the difference between those two, I think, jamless games kind of all get lumped together, but there's a really like strong variation within them Mm -hmm. of, of how they actually work. And some of them require low structure and some of them require a lot of structure. And I think if you look at just like Fiasco, Endurance, Jason, you know, those are, they have very different levels of structure at the beginning of play and during play. And I would love to hear your thoughts on, you know, what, what motivated that structure difference. Uh, I, I don't know that I agree with that. I think oh, they both, sure. <laughs> they, they actually, uh, I mean, it's sort of incremental development. They they seem quite similar to me in the amount of preparation, the, the amount of buy-in that you need uh, before you begin playing, and then the procedures to play, of course, are different. But in terms of handling time and sort of weight, I think that they're pretty similar. I, that's my impression. Um, obviously, people will will decide, and you know, if that if your experience is that uh, that they're substantially different, maybe I'm just too close to it to see that. Well, I mean. I would I would kind of contrast you know, fiasco with like Universalis, for example, which sounds more like what Mark's talking about. Yeah, there's a very, you can see a very distinct difference there. Very distinct, sure. right? right. Um, and that is much more structured to facilitate a competitive kind of bidding and all that mm -hmm. kind of construction of a of a universe through the mechanics of play, as opposed to through social level agreement about like what's cool or like what I think should happen next or whatever. And that's, it's interesting sort of for, for me because Universalis was not influential to me at all. I, mm -hmm. I've barely played it and uh, a game like Polaris really was very mm -hmm. much. Uh, and yet Polaris has that sort of competitive one-upmanship in it pretty clearly. As well, yeah. yeah. And Polaris also was, I, is directly in the, the DNA for uh, Annalise. Mm -hmm. Where, which also I think is much more on the structured end of this continuum, if for lack of a better word, where the game structure is really about almost enforcing a certain uh, kind of uh, certain kind of interaction, um, and it kind of takes it out of the players and doesn't doesn't ask the players to do certain things. It actually takes that into the game mechanics to do certain things, and where in Fiasco they're more. Uh, 
open to however your group does it, you know, make it work and have fun with it. Yeah. And that was a, I mean, that was a conscious choice and yeah. it's, it's, it's an effective one given mm -hmm. that particular uh, set of parameters, but certainly not for everything, obviously. But yeah, I think that's interesting to, to ask, you know, like the question who says what, when, yeah. Uh, and is that something that, that, uh, that you're putting in the text? And if so, why and you know how does how does that uh, promote what you're what you're trying to create as an experience of, at the table? Conversely, if you're not mm. seeing those kinds of elementary things about how you know this social protocol is assembled, you know what what does that mean? And that's a big part of I think designing in this space, making mm. those choices. Well, um, Adam Mini, one of the questions that he submitted that that I like, and I think we are already touching on it, so I just want to kind of nail that, is which do you think works better for GMless play? Is it a more adversarial type of game or more cooperative? Ooh, uh, I think that um, one of the things that uh, Jason and Nathan are both saying is that structure, structure matters in that. I think you can have a straight-up adversarial game as long as you have really, really good structure um, to really have the the ways in which we uh, create adversity for each other are really uh, defined well so that it stays within the scope of the game and that we are that the social place is, is still one of this is awesome fun and now my character is going to pound yours you know whatever <laughs> you know we got to make sure like that it's working at both levels right, right. Um, and I think that the the uh, I think that can be successfully done um, to have uh, adversarial, a good adversary uh, situation. What do you think, Jason? Uh, you contenders, think? yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know, I was yeah. going to say. Contenders, woo! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd go further than that. I'd say that I think GMless games can give adversarial play much better than GM games. Mm. Because Why it's is that? that level yeah, play, because it's that level playing field. There isn't one guy who's got infinite resources who can choose to cheat if they want, or hide their dice from them. You know, it, it's fair. You can step up. You know everyone's everyone's fighting with the same rules. And that doesn't, wow. one thing inter interesting about that is that doesn't mean that everyone has the same resources. Right. Which yeah. I think comes out also in uh, Hell for Leather, Joe, Joe's other, an, another of my favorite Joe Prince games, um, <laughs> where it's very asymmetrical in what power each individual role in that game has to affect the others, but that yeah, doesn't mean that anyone's like, steamrolled over. Right. I think that's a really good point to raise when we talk about GMless, which is in itself a misnomer, as was right. said earlier, that we're really talking about a spectrum of, of games, and it's, it's uh, absolute equality and absolute parity around the table is one choice that can be mm -hmm. made, but it's not right. necessarily the only or best choice, depending on what you need to do. So, you know, like, uh, you know, I can envision games where there's going to be someone who has you know, some GM powers or uh, th or some creative powers that other players don't. And I think that's great. That's fine. Um, I would, I'm sitting here reflecting that uh, 1001 Nights may fit perfectly in what you just said, Jason, you know, because there's, that's, there's technically not really a GM in that, you know, the, mm. the responsibilities of holding the storyteller role pass around the table. Mm -hmm. And right. a lot of the other mm. situations of, of um, reaction, setting large, you know, taking care of the big picture and all that sort of stuff uh, moves around. But one, yeah, thing that, one thing that I love about Thousand One Nights is that that GM role or that role revolves, but when you have it, oh, that yeah. is, you are infinitely, you're the genie, yeah. right? Like you yeah, have absolutely. infinite power. Yeah. Um, right. Which is, I don't know, it's very poetic in how it works in that game. So. And if I, if I remember correctly, can't you also play as the Shah? In the, the Sultan. In the Sultan, yeah, you can actually play as the Sultan, which is yes, like then this other level of complicated uh, authority yep. within the game, right? Because it's like an mm -hmm. in-character authority, which is really yeah, interesting. Yeah, super interesting the way it shifts when, there's, when someone's playing the Sultan at the table. Right. Unbelievable. Um, mm -hmm. Even when you're play, if there's someone playing uh, the Sultan's wife, like it, right. there's a there's an actual power dynamic shift because you're like whoa, you know, so it's it's really cool when that happens. I just um, finished another GMless game that has distinct turn taping uh, turn taking. Um, this is part of the Ethiopia project stuff that I've been working on, and 
structuring that very specifically, tying back to what Jason said about and about sharing around the space. So each person has a turn, and they have resources that they'll manip you know, manipulate investment and resources. Blah 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 blah. blah. But the point of uh, structuring uh, that space in very very uh, tight ways, the in the text is very it's very tightly structured to allow for very open, really open-ended creativity within that tightly structured space. Um, and that's the, I think that's the, the push-pull that creates an interesting balance in a GMless game or in a, a GM di uh, diaspora game. <laughs> Where you've got, you've got, to, you've got to have some push-pull. Either you have really good tight rules and mechanics and so on for framing that to create the open space or sort of the other end where it's like really open-ended but we all agree on some sort of social level what authorship we have over each bit and where where the constraints are because if both things are just wide open it's not I don't think it's really productive or fun or interesting even. Mm. you know I, I actually draw a lot on the time I spent as a world of darkness LARP GM which mm -hmm. is kind of a weird place to start but like I, I GM'd a, a vampire game for a long time, which is largely PvP and very heavily structured, so players don't murder each other at Denny's at the end of the night. Mm -hmm. And then I GM'd a werewolf game, which was very like, yeah, whatever, like it doesn't matter, we're all here having a good time, we have these packs, and well, yeah, we'll fight, let's fight, and then afterwards we'll have a beer and it'll be good. <laughs> and like, those two, those two very different play modes, they're very much like that adversarial versus cooperative. Um, I think about it a lot like a little holding environment, like a little crock pot, right? And if there's no heat, in the pot, like mm -hmm. it's not interesting. Like I ran vampire games that were like, okay, everybody's here and the social structure is perfect and yeah, this fits the fiction, but it's boring. Boring. Right? <laughs> and I played the vampire games where literally players storm out 30 seconds in because there's nothing holding the game together. Mm -hmm. Right? And so I think for me, we talked a little bit about what the hardest part to do is. Reflecting on it now, I think the hardest role to give somebody is like troublemaker. Right? That's really like, you know, when I play, especially when I play like Apocalypse World games, like, I think about my job as being, like, how do I keep the heat at the right level? Not so much that the characters just murder each other day one and there's no drama, and not so little that there's no drama at all. Like, how do I keep it at the right level? And that's really hard. It turns out that's really hard to, like, distribute because everybody has a different idea of what the right mm -hmm. level is. And maybe this just goes back to what Nathan was saying before, that it's the, it's the overarching. But I feel mm -hmm. like having somebody whose job it is to just, like, adjust the heat on the stove is really tough. Mm -hmm. That really ties nicely into the next question here. Yes. Uh, Dane Livarger sent a question, and I'm going to kind of shift gears from talking about designing games because I know you guys have probably played the games you've made. A um, <laughs> couple of times. A <laughs> <laughs> couple of times every half hour. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, in GM games, the GM typically also functions as the teacher of the rules. When facilitating a GMless game, how do you prevent that facilitator or teacher from effectively becoming the GM? Uh, can I take a stab at that? Yeah. Please, uh, please. I, well, first of all, I think that there's some degree of uh, self-awareness that's required for that person in the facilitator role. You need to recognize that, that the authority that's been invested in you as a facilitator is not... Uh, it doesn't make you different from everybody else at the table. Uh, and you act, kind of have to work against that sometimes. I know that uh, I will, uh, when, I'm, w when I'm in that role in a convention setting with strangers, for example, I'll make sure that uh, I deliberately give myself uh, a character who is going to defer to others or that is in a weaker position or that uh, mm -hmm. is, is, is in a place that allows, uh, allows me to demonstrate sort of how things work uh, without it without it becoming a, an issue of me exercising power within the game or in a metagame way. Uh, so I play the shit heel or the dummy or whatever, and that, that, that seems to help a lot. But uh, just being self-aware of that, I think, is a, a huge part of it. And uh, your, the way your game is structured can help with that as well, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Like, like, I don't know how you would do that with contenders. How you'd sit down to play contenders and be like, I'm the boss, and I'm going to say what's going on. It just wouldn't, right. it just wouldn't work. <laughs> wouldn't or work. you can try, but... <laughs> Whereas with Fiasco, I think you could. And, uh, and that's, yeah. you know, that's problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we, I played a game of our last best hope recently when we were playtesting a fantasy adventure. 
and I gave myself the role of this like dumb fighter who's like, I just want to get paid. Like I don't care about the world. <laughs> right. And I was really trying to do this thing that I've actually seen Jason do really beautifully. Um, and then like halfway through, there was a moment where like I really could die and it would fit the story, but I was like, no, I don't really like that. And, it was totally the wrong decision. And what ended up mm. happening was like my character ended up becoming way too much a part of the story. And you don't even notice it because you get sucked in, right? That's the point of the game is to kind of suck people in. And like at leaving, I was like, oh, I was kind of a douchey game. I was like, <laughs> like, I, like come play test my game and watch me be awesome. Like this is not good at all. Right. And, and I think Jason's right that it's having some self-awareness is tough because like, because there's a, hopefully there's a lot going on. And you want to like really step up and do something, but I think I wasn't thinking about the structure of the game. And that's you know, playing with your friends at home is totally different. And then right. you can All do right. that stuff. But but in in those settings where you're actively facilitating to teach people or, or to demonstrate yeah. it, and uh, that's important. The other thing is to to uh, demonstrate the techniques uh, and the behaviors that you expect at the table. So like if I'm playing a game where we've agreed on a particular rating for the game, I'm like this is going to be a hard R game, and we've got an X card on the table, and we're going to you know right. we're going to use that. I'm I do my best to use that to, to make yeah. sure that on a social level, everybody knows that it's cool to use this thing that we just talked about. Right, yeah. Yeah. Meg, yeah. Uh, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think that um, it's a real skill. Like as we transition from talking about designing games to how do you do this, right? Because there may be people watching who are like, how do you do? How do you run a GMless game? Mm -hmm. And I think they're probably being more and more GM diverse games mm -hmm. out there as it's something that people toy with more like what is this mm -hmm. thing where do we put these these who holds what parts of this toolbox um that skill that uh jason mentioned of being able to lead from behind and model the behaviors you you expect at the table that's even a space where you can model the tone and the setting and you know all those like how we create uh, the overarching picture um, and that way of, of leading from behind, and it's it's part of it really is purely on the physical level of turning to someone else. And I've seen Jason do this, and I do this, and I know other people do this. We're facilitating a game, but it's GMless, so I'm going to turn to somebody else and say, "Hey, Nathan, what do you think about this?" Mm -hmm. Because I have to actively demonstrate. That's part of teaching the game is mm. stepping back and incur and giving that hand out like all right so you know I'm inviting you to step up and mm. yeah uh, like what yeah what do you think about this or like how how does your character see that like yeah. or I need to know from you you know what your next step is or whatever the the rules demand and also whatever the the social conventions or polling the table saying hey yeah. I got nothing what what would be the coolest thing that could happen right now yeah who has an idea for a scene for my guy yep. Like, yep. that kind of thing right um I just had one other technique that I use a lot because I'm a, a head case about running my own games um which is I don't actually play uh I will be at the table and I will teach the rules and suggest but I don't actually have a character and I don't actually participate creatively. So you're just there um, to creep everybody out? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I just kind of sit there and just creep everyone out. Um, which works great for me. Um, no, but seriously, especially if it's a larger, like at convention games, if it's like a large table or something, or like the game can only really, only really play as well with three or four people. If there's three yeah. or four people who show up, I'm like, all right, well, you know, I'll you guys will play and I'll walk you through the procedures right. and then I kind of act as a cheerleader kind of for the rest yeah. of the, for the no, session. I've done exactly the same. Yeah. For, for, it's the easiest gym and give you give you'll get a convention ever. <laughs> oh, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's <laughs> amazing. Way to get friendly to conventions. Just facilitate yeah. a couple of gymless games. Right, right. Awesome. Yeah. Sometimes two at a time, right? I'll be running two fiasco yeah, right. games I've, right next to each other. I, I've done that as well, where I was facilitating two tables of families at a convention, two, three person game. I will, as a counterpoint to that, Nathan, though, I'll say that it's much, much easier to guide a game in a positive direction if you're participating, yeah. if it's a GM list game. I, I, I use that technique because it also just makes it easier for me sometimes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I get it. So. Uh, this question is from Chris Engel, and it kind of jumps back into the design space. Um, 
How does a GMless game get a novice player to make the transition from passive to active play? Because I, it, me, I just GMless play. Everybody's got to kind of be on, right? In a GM game, if you're not there, you can kind of hang back. But if you've distributed everything, uh, what do you do? Uh, Meg, I want to. <laughs> okay, so what's the first style of play that we all played? It's sure. it's GMless. Sure. I mean, like, 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 play, play. like cops and yeah, robbers. Like yeah. yes, cops and robbers, or let's go to the moon, or um, we're going through the woods and it's really dark and there's a monster. Oh, monster! Whack it with a stick. You know, right. GMless is the first type of play that we have, um, and then uh, you know, as little kids, and then as we desire more structure to our play. We find that as we get older, we get more intellectually complex, blah, 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 you know, all these things. We wind up wanting more structure in there. Like, okay, I, I want some dice in here. I want to, and then like the storytelling kicks in and there's going to be one of the eight-year-olds who's really got the mind on the story and they're going to be the GM and it's going to be great. So coming back to GMless play is, I think, part of a cycle of recognizing what we can do or have done or, or could do and allow giving ourselves the permission to be active in that way so making helping you know the, a player who is less uh, less forthcoming with their creative input to make that tr transition to be fully invested I, I think there's a process there of, of getting out of the way a little bit like stepping back I'm gonna just keep stepping back and you're gonna keep walking toward me and I'm going to keep stepping back and you're going to keep coming toward me so that um, it's a, a gradual thing and I keep turning to you and saying what about this and like well could it could it be that yeah it totally can be that <laughs> what next yeah, can yeah. I do that yeah totally and that process of um, giving people permission to be creative to take initiative to um, be an active participant in not only uh, their own character, but in the world, and in oh, like stepping up if someone says, "Oh, I don't know what I, don't, I got nothing for my guy," right. being willing to say, oh, "I have an idea," you know, it, mm. I, I think that's that's where that hinges, and I think that that's how uh, GMless games can help that make that transition is to open up the space. And it, uh, yeah. it the, oh, go ahead, Mark. Oh, just I I played with a lot a lot of the early. I just do a lot of testing with people who don't play very many games. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, part of it's like I do, I'm here in grad school and there's just all these people and I'm like, hey, we should spend some time together. Come test this game. Um, but some of the early testing I did with Eternity was like people who had played a lot of games, a lot of storyteller-driven mm -hmm. games. And they had that exact same process of would it be okay if... And like yeah. one of the things that happened early was you play this god in Eternity. I thought the god would be like your avatar. You would always have that character. It might not be in every scene but you would stick with your character. And one of these sort of experienced role players who was kind of locked into one mindset said, well, I want somebody else to play my god. And I was like, no, 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 the rules, and the table just exploded. They're like, no, that's wrong. No, Mark is wrong about this game. You should be allowed to do this. <laughs> that like, sounds oh, fine. <laughs> fine, okay, cool, you can do that if you want. Like, I don't, that's fine. And like, it was just really cool to see them come out of that shell. And I, Meg just really beautifully described the process of me just constantly being like, yes, you're the GM. I know, I know like for the last 15 years of your life, you've let somebody else sort of run the game and you participated, but now you're the GM. You just, whatever you want, man, totally cool. Yeah. So I really just wanted to emphasize, I think there's something really um, hard. Like when I GM GMless games, there's something like really heartfelt about watching, especially at conventions, players sort of light up in mm -hmm. a specific way. Yeah. It's really cool. I want to, uh, there's a, uh, that Meg's uh, thoughts on that brought up a point which I think is worth at least mentioning, which is that that sort of unfettered creative freedom, typically someone's first exposure to that uh, ends up being completely gonzo. Right. Uh, <laughs> you know, that that right. uh, they'll start with saying, can I, might I, and then once they get, once they, they absorb that knowledge that yes they can they can do whatever they want if there's nobody to tell them no it it goes they, they push it as far as they can just because they want to experience that mm -hmm. and so it gets in, insane and then uh you know if they play enough they reel that back in uh, but first games often very very gonzo yeah is that your experience guys that's 100 percent my experience <laughs> <laughs> i think i think for for some you know what, I, I think for our last Bestopen Eternity, I 
have a very strict genre definition for, for both games, I think. Like, for our last best hope, like, you're supposed to be heroes saving the world. So a lot of times people will kind of throw out ideas and the other players are like, well, I thought we were supposed to be heroes. And so, like, it gets narrowed a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but it's certainly true for, I think, Fiasco, which has a much broader genre. Uh, where it can, you know, I think you covered it really well in the companion. Like, it doesn't have, people treat it as if it has to be the Big Lebowski every time, right? right. You know? But like, like, no, actually it could just be, you know, Fargo and like be just people who live in this town and, and have these lives. And I think um, part of it has to depend on, for the GMless game, how wide the, like, I think of it as like a little valve, right? Like, how, how wide is the genre rule? Mm -hmm. Is the genre rule really big and you can kind of do whatever you want in this game and set it in space and do whatever? Or is it very tight and you're supposed to, like, kind of have one view of how things go? Uh, yeah. But I would agree that people tend to push it once they, because they want to find the boundary. Like, they want to know where is the boundary. And so they push it in different ways, but they definitely push it. I'd love to hear what Joe's thoughts are. You know, like Joe's, because uh, with Contenders mm. and you know other other stuff that you've written, um, this seems like a really interesting place. I'd love to get your hear your answer. Yeah, I think that Mark's last point is, is speaks to it. People want to find that boundary and stuff, mm -hmm. and it is there is a lot of freedom. Just I, mean, I can just narrate anything now and, and go with it but there has to be some way in the mechanics of someone to step up and just say well that's, that's the boundary, that's as far as you can go that's as far as the scope is at that point for you to narrate that will make sense um, and and yeah I have found that people who don't have the same kind of background in role play or the baggage as role players will, will tend to overextend that to the point of narrating what other, other characters are doing, other mm -hmm. players' characters right. are doing or saying, and, stuff. and that's when you really have to kind of really say, "Oh no, you, you, that's one thing you don't have authority over. You can't say what what they're saying, what they're doing. <laughs> right. You know, they get, you know they, that's their character. They get to decide about that." Um, but I think a lot of it is down to the, the structure. If the structure's there, then it tells you how far you can go with that and uh, where it gets real into. I was just part of the GM list game on G plus. Um, uh, Charles Moore just started this, opened a thread with a, a scenario, like a little paragraph scenario, and I answered, and then other people answered, and then all of a sudden we were playing this game. And watching that process was very interesting in my game. Uh, watching uh, it went for like a whole weekend or a couple of days. Um, it was very cool, and watching the process of people. Uh, contribute information and then sort of act as moderating forces on each other's contributions and how we're going to structure this and watching one uh, character like just totally go gonzo right like boom, 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 crazy it was awesome fit yeah. very well but it was very much in that structure of like oh here's someone who hasn't played in a while and he was very upfront like I haven't done this in a long time this is super fun and I think that's part of also the gonzo thing is mm -hmm. it so fun to be contributing and to have all your your contributions really welcome, that it's like, this is great, um, and people can get over the top of that too. But the yeah. the process of checks and balances and sort of how do we do um, like what Joe's mentioning of like how we say, well, maybe not that. Let's 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 yeah. rein it in a little bit. It's very really cool to see. But is that the responsibility of the game, or is that sidebar? You're being very quick with these questions, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to feed you guys. Uh, is that the responsibility of the text or of the kind of the group in the moment? I think Richard. I think you mute, muted yourself. Oh, I uh, we could hear him. Can yeah. okay. Can, can you, you hear, hear us now, Meg? Meg, can you hear me? No, it's you. It's right, not yeah. us. It's you. <laughs> Something is going strange going technologically. Down. Okay. Um, so, is it the responsibility? And I'll try to type this to Meg, but I'm slow typing. Is this the responsibility of the text or the group in the moment? Right, because it's going to be a sliding scale. Is that something where you just coach somebody within the text, and then when you show up with random three to five folks, that's what you decide uh, as to how to to guide it? Personally, I think it's the text. I think the text should be there to give you that, to say that you know, that's the structure. That's how far you can go. That's the scope of that scene. Well, I think it's at least, at the very least, it's a design choice whether you whether you address that 
with rules or with structure or with soft, you know, like soft advice or whether you leave it open. Um, I think it's a, I think there, you know, there could be, because there's different ways to approach it. Uh, I think at least having it in your game somewhere is probably a good idea. <laughs> well, <laughs> also, to guide it towards, to guide a game towards where you want it to go, but you yeah, can I guess put it all up on the social yeah, level. Yeah, I would, I would say that uh, it's, it's probably a good idea to point to that as a potential issue that you need to address mm -hmm. one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, whether your game requires very specific uh, rules about that that you want people to follow or whether you want to give it to them to work out themselves, calling that out is smart one way or the other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, sometimes it's actually about limiting communication, right? Because um, I think the quiet year does a really cool job of limiting communication. Meg, Meg's excited, but yeah. I mean, when I, the first time I played the quiet year, I was like, this is so cool because I can't tell you what I think about your actions, right? So you have this map and you put stuff on the map and everybody, it's GMless because everybody, when you're, when it's your turn, you just do whatever you want, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, you want to put a new thing on the map and it's a freaking dragon, go, right? And if you want to say, you know, the dragon has machine guns, go, like and and yet there's this sort of like silent judging that <laughs> mimics communities contempt and contempt right? <laughs> and this, there's this mechanic where you take a you take a point of contempt when someone does something you don't like but it, it's not clear in the rules like is it something you don't like as a player or something you don't like as the faction you feel like you've come to represent or both and so it's all very murky but it just felt really fulfilling like to to engage and not talking <laughs> It was really, really strange. It was a revelation for me in Microscope where there, there are rules that are like, you ask your question and everybody else just shut up. Right. Everybody, mm -hmm. you, you cannot say right. anything. Shut mm -hmm. up, which was really cool. I thought that was, uh, that was a revelation to me. Is that, is that the inspiration for the guide? Yeah, very much. Drives? Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I, and I, you know, I, I mentioned it at the, in the thank yous at the beginning. That right. I, st I stole that sort of out of whole cloth from Microscope. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. All right, now I want each of you to, to think about the GMless games that you've written. Uh, this question comes from Emily Care Boss. Okay. Now you got to talk about <laughs> your game. Uh, so uh, the question is, what does your GMless game do to empower players to create together? How does it encourage communication between players about what interests them and what they would like to do next in the story? Uh, all right. So I'll start with Nathan. <laughs> um, all right. So there's kind of a let's see. So I guess I'll just be specific. Um, I was trying to think of like a general case, but my games are too different. And I can't think of one. Um, Aha! That's why I said talk about your game. You can't right. get general. Right. <laughs> so in in Annalise, uh, there's a really specific uh, mechanic about uh, how players uh, establish stuff that or or pull out stuff that they think is interesting that other people have contributed. So it's called a claim. And whenever another player is just narrating, whether they're talking about their character or just setting a scene or, or replying to something or whatever, if they describe something and you think it's really cool, you say, you just take a card and you write down the thing that they said and you put some tokens on it and it becomes a mechanical thing. And so it's like, oh, I, you just described whatever, the moonlight through the shattered mirror and that was beautiful. And so moonlight through shattered mirror, write it down. Um, and that becomes a currency that you use throughout the rest of the game. But the key there is that you can only pull, you can only claim stuff that other people contribute. You can't claim your own contribution. <laughs> so it's really effective it's in play. play. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's really effective in play about wow. unifying the tone of the game as you go along, and then you use those later to help you out when you're when you need more resources for whatever you're doing. Um, and you see some things fall by the wayside and stuff, some stuff comes up over and over and they become motifs um, in the game. So that was something that I was pretty happy about how that ended up working out in, in the framework of that game. Um, I was going to point to one specific item. Good. Meg, what about you? Well, um, 
in, how does it encourage communication? So in Thousand One Nights, uh, it's pretty much straight up what em it does what Emily's question is asking about um, <laughs> saying you, you take a gem from the Sultan's bowl and you say this is what I'm this is what I'm interested in. I wonder if the the camel will uh, eat the princess, you know, because wouldn't that be fun um, <laughs> and weird? Uh, and that the way that that structures space where you're giving feedback to the storyteller who holds a lot of the GM power while they're while it's their turn to do so um, and it also communicates what your interests are in to the rest of the group uh, so you're being really uh, giving that communication and building doing that world building not that stuff together um, in a very very concrete way here is what I'm interested in and if this comes up then there's mechanical repercussions for that you you and on both sides you and I'm telling you this is this is what I'm interested in Here's what you can do to earn this this gem. You know, you can bring this into the story, and then it can resolve. And then either you're going to get it or I'm going to get it. So it's very, very, very concrete. Um, in the game I just uh, wrote for the Ethiopia Project, uh, Champion Girls, it, it's um, there's this concrete asking. You have turns, and on your turns, you get to do a different thing. One of the things you get to do is ask a question or um, add a detail. Uh, and it's very distinct, you know, it, it, of the four things you might do on your turn, you pick two. Two of them are distinctly con contributing to world building and what it's like and how the, how the uh, space that we inhabit is structured. So, yeah. Very cool. Mark. Um, so in our last Best Hope, the, the, you're, you know, you're creating a crew of people to save the world, and it starts very sort of, um, innerly, inwardly focused. So you tell, you know, what you what your role is. Like if you're a scientist or an engineer, and then what you left, le what you brought with you on this mission, and what you left behind. And then it expands a little bit out into talking about what assets your team has, and they all go on index cards, right? And they're all in front of the whole group all the time. But then the last piece that really ties people together is the threat pool. So you're going to face these threats along your way to accomplishing your mission. Like you know, you're going to face. Um, broken airlocks on the way to try to destroy an asteroid that's going to hit the Earth. Um, and you each generate a threat, and then they go into a pool face down. So you know yours because you put it in the pool, but only the guy who gets to pick a threat gets to see all of them, right? And so what that does is it creates this thing where you have, like, these five or three potential ways the story could go, and they're right there in front of you. Like, everybody has come up with these ideas. And you can pick your own idea, but actually I find most people don't do that. They're like, no, I think this other idea is more interesting or would make me a better player or would, that's sort of the social norm is to think about, well, who else's idea can I bring in? And it's physically there on a card and you play it. Like, I'm going to interrupt with this threat now. And so I think that there's something about that that really drives people towards one story. And now that I think about it, it actually does a little bit of what Nathan was saying about giving it an arc. Right? So there's one, there's one player who in that moment, their job is to say, what would kind of make sense with what happened mm -hmm. before? and give us options for what will happen later. And I think that mechanic does a good job of, of wrapping that up together. Cool. Good. Joe, tell us about Contenders or any of your other wonderful oh. games. No worries. I'll talk about uh, Eternal Contenders, which is the upcoming second edition. Oh. What? 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 what is what? happening? Big no! <laughs> Yeah, this is hopefully coming out soon. It's been uh, it's been supposedly coming out for about the last year and stuff. I'm publishing it in conjunction with uh, Chronicle City, but it is basically um, second edition of Contenders, but switching it instead of um, being focused on boxing stories, it's moving more into fantasy gladiatorial arenas and things like that, which will hopefully connect a bit more maybe with some of the uh, role playing base. <laughs> <laughs> I just know that the boxing theme put a lot of people off. Although I love the boxing game, and I'm still going to do the version where it's, it's purely about the boxing, but uh, this is using the same kind of structure. And um, creating together, like, one of the things that is from the outset, and, and it's gone in most games that have been run, even though I've put in a, a default setting, is the idea that you collaborate to build a setting, to build the world in which these stories take place. And uh, the only kind of provisor is that... Um, you know, there's some form of ritualized combat. 
some form of, of duels or gladiatorial combat that happens in that setting. And other than that, you kind of give them free reign to go where you want with it. And you know, a friend of mine's just finished running a campaign where they went for like a really kind of steampunk setting um, with that, where they had all the, the fighters, all the warriors, you know, using various different bits of steampunk tech, and it was very kind of Victoriana dueling, like tapping people with gloves to challenge them. To do it. <laughs> and there was one player was the suffragette who was like campaigning for you know right for the right for the vote for women. Another one was a, a, a female duelist who disguised herself as a man so that she could get into the dueling academy and try and uh, make her way in the world. Um, so I think that's that's you know from the ground up you get to you build that setting together something that you, that you want to play in and uh, and then further on in the game as well there's, there's mechanics for for crosses whereas that it is seen conflict if you draw a joker then that means that something some element some character some place or some item from that scene has to cross over into the next scene so the next person when it's their turn to take their scene they have to incorporate something in that way so they choose something they found interesting in your scene, in your part of the story, and they get into their story, which ties it all together. Um, and it works pretty well. You're on the hook now, because I really want to <laughs> I really want a copy, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no oh, more shilly shelly. It should be out mm. in the next month, I'm hoping. <laughs> so good. Thanks, Joe. Oh Jason. Uh, so I'll talk about uh, two games uh, first, uh, so in endurance, uh, I just sort of threw out character monogamy, which does a great job of uh, uh, getting people to have to create together and work together. Yes. Um, so, uh, so that that's a very simple, uh, it's a simple solution to a complicated problem that's not actually so simple. But what I really want to talk about <laughs> is uh, Emily's game, Breaking the Ice, which yeah! uh, which I, I think she was just fishing for someone to, 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 to name check her game by asking that question. But it's such a good example of this. It's all about, it's really all about bleed, right? You're, you're, uh, the, the, the character and the player are, uh, are going to be very dissimilar deliberately, but they are also going to be making statements kind of about one another, which is just fascinating. So, like, you're you're playing across your own personal state in some way, and and the choices you make there are telling. So, if you're if you're male, you really you're supposed to play somebody who's female, for example. Um, and then you're using all this collaborative association tools that the game provides that uh, helps you generate toning situation. Uh, and it's a two-player game, so it's very intimate, uh, and uh, it works great. Uh, uh, so I think that as an example of a game that has very uh, specific techniques that uh, are really designed to address the very question we're talking about, breaking the ice is the first one I would look at. Yeah, straight up. Very cool. Uh, all right, I'm going to stay with you, Jason, as we come okay. to nearly the close of the panel. Uh, this question is from Quinn Murphy. Thank you, Quinn. And the question is, what is the next big thing in terms of RPG game design? Um, and you can step outside of GM list because we did talk about you know innovations. But if you want to keep within that framework of, of GM list, I'm perfectly happy. What approaches or mechanics do you see pushing things forward in RPG design? Sure, GM list is so over. That's so last <laughs> year. Uh, I think we're going to see. Uh, Totally yeah, the, uh, um, the, uh, the cool things that we're going to see, the new hotnesses, are going to be things like um, characterless games games that don't mm -hmm. have uh, player characters or that uh, uh, have no character monogamy in, in really radical ways. Um, we're starting to see some of that, and that's really exciting. I think we're going to see games that have programmed instruction. We're going to see, we already are seeing those. Um, games that uh, are uh, uh, combining or hybridizing live action play with, role, with tabletop role playing in interesting yeah. ways. That's an area that I'm completely obsessed with in my design work right now. So. That's what I would say. There's three. <laughs> Done. All right. Uh, Joe, Done. You, you, you can't list your upcoming game, but uh, <laughs> what's the next big thing? The next big thing. I think this is the next big thing. I think Google Hangouts. Mm. Yeah. And I think this is, this is what's going to be next in RPG design. You know, can design games specifically to be played over Hangouts or played online, played virtually. Because um, it's, it's so easy to just 
Facebook Cup, get online, meet people who are ready to play games yeah. and things. And it's in, that is like my bugbear that it's really hard for me to actually find the time and schedule gaming in to get regular get regular games. It's like the whole the, the mythical you know weekly game is just something that of a holy grail that I've just I've given up on almost, mm-hmm. <laughs> unfortunately. So I think it's it's looking at uh, yeah rule systems that are going to work well online. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I could talk mm-hmm. forever and ever about the wonder of Hangout RPGs. <laughs> uh, Mark, what's, uh, yeah, what's the new hotness, man? Yeah, I got to echo a lot of what Jason said, so I'm going to try to go beyond that. But characterless, I mean, The Quiet Year, really, really cool game. I think we'll see a lot of stuff like that in the next couple of years. Um, I would say that one thing is... is uh, long form games so like you know we've been playing a lot of the indie games have been one shots and and short things and i know there have been lots of long form games in the past but of course the new hotness is always the old hotness <laughs> right? so in this particular case i mean like i'm part of uh the group that did christicon um at mm-hmm. dreamation and we were playing marvel uh four sessions of marvel four hours each one continuous narrative and there was just like this huge explosion of interest in this idea of being able to play at one con or in one weekend over Hangouts, one huge narrative where characters can emerge over time as being really important. Um, and I think this whole, like, you know, what, what I playfully call long con uh, mm-hmm. GMing could actually create its own games. And you have a game that's supposed to be played out in, like, three, mm-hmm. four sessions in one con, and then people leave. Um, and it kind of combines, like Jason said, some of the LARPing mm-hmm. elements uh, with some tabletop elements. And I think... That could be something that would really fit this idea. Like Joe said, you can't get together for a weekly game. It's tough. But you can go to a con, and if we're at a con, why don't we you know, spend 10 hours together? We do it anyyway. Let's spend mm-hmm. 10 hours playing one game and drive this really cool story. I think there's some cool new hotness in there. It's a little early, but I think, it's, I think it could be there. Yeah. Very cool. Well, as we come near to the close, uh, Meg, what, what do you have for the new hotness? New hotness for me. Okay, I think two places. One is tiny, tiny games. Um, I just have to, I just have to say this, uh, Epidiah Ravishaw's new game, Vast and Starlit, holy crap, I played it, it's gemless, it's fantastic, and it fits on a business card, it's brilliant, um, and, uh, this goes right in with what Joe was saying, and a little bit in a sort of odd backward way to, um, to what Mark just said, in terms of having games that fit in your life, like Google Hangouts or like a little tiny game that I could, hey, we're both standing here waiting for the bus. Let's play a little tiny bit of a game. And that those could go into part of a long con game so that we can play, have these long epic games that continue, but that can be played in little tiny chunks of time and space wherever we are. Hmm. So we're walking down the street to town. Great, let's play a little bit of this game. Uh, any, oh, we've got a two hour drive to get to this convention. I got a game, you know that sort of thing. Games that are that really fit in that sort of space, and like that's one of the places I see um, really happening. Um, yeah, because the other other stuff that I think is coming up, other people have already said. Cool, uh, and Nathan. All right, um, I agree with, with what everyone else said. <laughs> uh, an accurate portrait of where things are right now. And I'll actually say that I think um, not necessarily in terms of game design, though there is obviously overlap, but in terms of game publishing, uh, I think we're, oh. we're entering into a period where we're going to start seeing almost uh, more, of a, more of a perpetual beta kind of model for a lot of games uh, where things aren't necessarily going to have this concrete... I am playtesting this game, and now I'm done playtesting it, and I'm going to publish it, and now I've mm. published it, and it's out. Mm. Um, and then down the road, maybe I'll revise it or whatever. Uh, I think we're seeing... I think we're... we're In terms of where, like, the, the kinds of games that people are doing and the kinds of technology that are available for distributing them are going to create this kind of period where it'll be more of a continuum of like releasing a game, maybe working on it, releasing it again, having some people who releasing it to some people, not necessarily everyone, the whole public, but like inner circle, outer circle, public, whatever, back and forth of revisions and I don't know, I just I've I've been working on some stuff in that kind of way and I've been 
in the circles of other people who are working on stuff that way, and there's no reason why it has to end with a printed book, I think. Um, and that's a really interesting and exciting possibility that's right on the horizon for, for publishing. So that's I, I think it's I think it's more than on the horizon. And one of the things that you that that brings up makes me think of is the rise in shipping prices that we just oh saw my god in the US. Yeah. it's huge. Yeah. So yeah. in keeping with what you said, one of the things that I suspect is going to come soon is uh, more uh, published games that have no text that have no mm -hmm. printed text. So that it's going to be more and more PDF only or printed oh, or designed for ebook or even only. here's my yeah. Google Plus post that I'm going to update every couple exactly. of weeks with the newest Precisely. versions. Yeah, yeah because kind of you know we're that that <laughs> doubling the shipping costs overseas. Oh my god! Uh, there's going to be some very because you know I'm not going to feel ethical about passing on. You know now you have to pay as much as the book is worth. You know, as much as the cover yeah. price, or, as or you're the book. paying more than yeah. cover for some right. stuff. Right? Yeah, like, to I get have, the book, there's yeah. it becomes five dollar like games. Not going to yeah. happen exactly. Yeah. And and by that same token, I recently I just wasn't on it before. Joined the Dungeon World Tavern Google community, mm -hmm. and like you would never know there's a published game. Like people just have like tons and tons and tons of ideas, and like like they're throwing out new classes, and like the published game did not end the discussion for those people at mm -hmm. all. Right? Same with Apocalypse think it's, World. Yeah, same with Apocalypse World. Like, yeah, it's so sure. cool to just continually have these discussions. I think Nathan's yep. honestly really big there. Yeah. Yeah, that is great. Well, uh, we have met our hour and then some. Thanks, um, all of you. Nathan, Meg, Mark, Joe, Jason, thank you all for giving us some time to talk about GMS Games and their innovations. Um, this is another part of uh, Pound Game Night, and this is the March uh, talk about GMS and crazy games. So thanks, guys. And coming up in less than an hour, if you're watching this live, uh, at 9 p.m. Eastern time will be the panel I'll be moderating, which will be talking about game design contests. <laughs> So uh, even more craziness will come out from that. So thanks, everyone, uh, for listening. And please give us your feedback as we have this uploaded on the YouTube channel. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye-bye.